Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Sweeney, Texas. This is the sermon portion of our worship service from September 25th, 2016. The title of the sermon is The Cost of the View. This is why I kneel before the Father. Every ethnic group in heaven and on earth is recognized by him, and I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the Spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith as a result of having strong roots in love. I ask that you'll have the power to grasp love's width and length, height and depth, together with all believers. I ask that you know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge, so that you may be filled entirely with the fullness of God. Glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask for or imagine by his power at work within us. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and always. Amen. Ephesians 3, 14-21, Common English Bible. If you've watched much uh, in, in the last few years of, of HGTV, one of the things that you can hear them often say is the number one rule of real estate is location, location, location. They say it all the time. It, it, it's nothing at all uncommon to hear that the, the location is important. And sometimes for people it's that they want to be close to a particular school for their kids or, or they want to be close to where they work or they want to be a long way from where they work. Or they want to be where the action is, where the nightlife is, where all the good things seem to be happening. Or they want that space million dollar view. And they want that big view. The thing that, that just opens up and, and opening your eyes and looking out the window in the morning when you first wake up and you see that spectacular view. It's all about the location. They want something that's grand. I thought I thought a lot about that idea of something that's grand and some of the most beautiful places that I've been. I can't get a view of that. And when I was 12 years old, my family took a a Western United States trip. And the place that stuck out in my mind more than any place else that we went was Crater Lake in Oregon. And I just thought this had to be the most beautiful place on earth. Now, I hadn't been that many places on earth, but I just still thought it was gorgeous. And, and you can see up on the screen, I mean, even in this picture, how, if you haven't ever been there, it's this giant volcano with a small volcano that's actually called Wizard Island right there in the middle of it. And the walls of the outer volcano shield the, the lake, the, inner, the, the outer volcano, the, both are extinct now, but, but it shields the light from the wind. And it's like looking out on this blue sheet of glass. It is one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen. And for my 12-year-old mind, I, I can't tell you for how long I wanted to live in Oregon just because of Crater Lake. I absolutely love that place. Now, I, I also on that same trip we made a, 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 a trip through the Painted Desert. I didn't find it all that spectacular at that time, but a couple of years ago Cindy and I with my parents drove out to California to see the grandkids, and in the, my parents' case the grandkids and great-grandkids, and on the way back we drove through the Painted Desert. And while I didn't get any of it when I was 12 years old, it was spectacular. It was the, next to the grandkids, it was the most beautiful thing I saw on the trip. And it was absolutely gorgeous. Well, after those, that trip when I was 12, when I was 15 years old, I, I made a trip. If you read my blog this week, I um, think it was Wednesday, I talked a little bit about a lake named Silence in Canada. 
Uh, I went with Explorer Scouts up there. We flew 110 miles into the wilderness and we canoed back and we were on this lake named Silent. Now, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. You can go on my blog and read it, but because I really felt the presence of God in a really spectacular way on that trip, on that lake, that one lake in particular, it always holds a special place in my heart. And 40 years later, I still think it's as beautiful as I did then, even though the only place I really see it anymore is online. And then I went to Norway in the Navy, my second cruise when I was in the Navy, and we went into the fjords. Now, I know that most of you probably have never been there, and most of you will probably never get to go. I'm sorry for you because it is absolutely spectacular. I mean, these giant cliffs, sheer cliffs, raising up hundreds of feet in the air, and unlike what a lake that we might see today is like, or even the beach you walk out and you slowly get deeper into the water, I mean, it falls off and goes straight down hundreds of feet. Just rising up out of the water. And pictures, as beautiful as they can be, will never do justice to what you see. Now, all of these places have one thing really in common, and that is, as much as you might like the view, you're not going to buy it, no matter how much money you've got. Because they're not for sale. I mean, the Painted Desert, Crater Lake, those are national treasures. Silence is in a provincial park in Canada called Quitico. They're not giving it up anytime soon. We can't live in those places. We can't have those views to ourselves every day. So it, it's not available regardless of the price. Now, when I went into the Navy, I kind of thought that that song, uh, I Thought Love of Texas in My Rearview Mirror, was written about me because that was my aim as much as anything else. While I was in the Navy, I learned I was pretty stupid. And when I got out and I came home, I rediscovered the beauty of my own sex. And, and I, I rediscovered it in one place probably more often than anywhere else in those, in those days. And, and that was in one of my boyhood haunts, Camp Strike, which Camp Strike is just, that, well, it was just outside of Conroe. And while I would have thought it would have fallen into that same category if you couldn't buy it at any price, I was wrong because they recently sold it. And they're building a new camp somewhere around Cleveland that they're going to call Camp Strike. But this will always be Camp Strike to me. And I could have that view probably now. But I probably can't afford it. Because, you see, even those spectacular views, I mean, they, they, might, they cost a lot of money and they can, you can save a whole lot by moving just a hundred yards down the street where maybe the view's not quite so spectacular. See, that place. About this time I went into the ministry, or actually a little bit later than that, a few years after I went in, I was appointed up in Canton, and, and I discovered a place driving through Jacksonville called Scenic Lookout. And you can't really tell it from, the, from this picture. I couldn't find a good picture of it. But there are these great big, huge pine trees that look down into a valley and, and kind of rolling hills and and as long as pine trees and rolling hills are there, I mean, I'm a sucker for that property. I don't know if you can buy property there around that scenic lookout in Jacksonville or not. But it's got this great view. And people would love that and pay good money for it. My parents moved to Bernie for exactly this reason. They moved to Bernie for the view. Now, this isn't of the view from the house that they built. This is, I, I, nobody has a picture of, from the front porch of their house. They, this is actually from the subdivision they built in, and, 
And it looked somewhat like this. I mean, there was rocks out there in their yard, but if you look past the rocks, there were these great hill country shots. You could see the hills in the background. And, and, and that was their whole reason for moving to Barney. Now, at the same time, I would tease them about, you moved to Barney for this? I mean, these rocks and this cactus in your front yard? Because that was what you could see up close. Now, there is a cost that goes with having a view. The better the view, the more valuable the property. And somebody in New Hampshire figured that out. Because you see, in New Hampshire, like Texas, there's no state income tax. But unlike Texas, there also is no sales tax that goes to the state. So the only thing that they have to make their revenue on is property tax. And so the legislature there is always looking for ways to increase revenue. And some genius came up with the idea of what they are called, what some people at least are calling the view tax. And what that really turns into is what we would call the appraisal district. I have no idea what they call it in New Hampshire. They go out to your property and they appraise your view. And it might be something like this. Now, the problem with that is our opinions of what is a beautiful view can vary from one person to another. My parents thought that view at Bernie was wonderful, and I thought, mm, too many rocks for my taste, no pine trees. And so, if I inherited that home, which I won't because they've since sold it, but if I inherited that home, I'm stuck now paying taxes on a view that I don't even like. And such is the case for many people, and it costs the many of these people double in their property taxes. Some have tried to take it to court, but most of the time, few have gotten some reduction in this view tax, but most of the time, the state wins, and it's caused people to have to sell their property and move away, some actually moving to Canada. There's a cost to that location, to that view. In our lesson this morning, Paul sounds invested in a view. And you, you read his words, and, and if you read them out of context, with, and with, we're starting where we did at verse 14, you're starting actually out of context. Because you don't really know where Paul is unless if you know the story of the, him writing the book of Ephesians. But he, he talks about this grand stuff. What he, he sees, and I, mean, I want you to think about this for a minute because it may look grand and it may sound grand, but here's the problem Paul was in jail. And can you imagine looking at the world through bars and still think of me? And in the ancient world, much of the time, prisons were built in the least desirable areas. There would have been nothing worth looking at. But Paul sees it. Paul sees it because Paul is aware of all that God is doing around him. And Paul doesn't just see the, the scenery. What Paul's really looking at is something beyond what's right in front of him. Paul's looking at the hand of God it worked in the world around him. Paul is looking at the kingdom that's to come. And he talks about bowing down. And yet he's doing it from a jail cell. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly, Paul says. He uses words and phrases like riches, glory, fullness. Then he begins with powerful words of praise and confidence in God. How can 
can do that. Paul can do it because he has a vision for the future. He has a view of the future. And that view enables him to see past his circumstance into a world where the world that God wants it to be, a world that, that we walk hand in hand with our brothers and sisters, regardless of all the external things around us, that we walk in love. That's Paul's vision. It's Paul's view. No, he's not literally seeing that out his window, but he's seeing it in his mind's eye. And he's calling on, on the Ephesians and on us to walk with him in this vision. A vision of the world God wants it to be. And you know, from Paul's time through the centuries into our time, it happens. It continues to happen over and over and over again. We see people who, who look at, at just disastrous kinds of situations. We see people who look at starving children and how sad and devastating that appears to be. But instead of running away, they decide to do something about it. You know, there's hungry kids in the world. There's hungry kids in our society. There's hungry kids in our community. And people like us are reaching out to do something about it. That's part of Paul's view. It's part of his vision. To see the repulsive and sickening situation, but to stick around and do something about it. Throughout history, there have been people like that. People like William Booth, who, who worked hard in the world, in the, in the, among the poor of anyone. I want to get clipped one more time, I'm sorry. Well, I'll keep moving that. Then people like Albert Schweitzer. I mean, Schweitzer, among the poor in Africa. And then people like Mother Teresa, who ministered to the dying poor in India. Over and over and over again, people throughout history have, have seen the need and they've stepped up to meet the need. People have been at work. I mean, people work through charities, through helping organizations, through 12-step groups, through hospitals, and through all kinds of different ministries. And then you get things more personal. People work with troubled kids. Volunteer at hospitals and in soup kitchens. They tutor kids. They find ways to reach out and to help. When life falls, they look out and they catch a glimpse of the vision. They catch a glimpse of what needs to be done in the world, and they do it. But here's the thing. As people of faith, we have to have kind of a, a bifocal vision. Right? You can't really tell it by looking at my glasses, but they actually are bifocals. And the bottom, of course, lets me read things up close, and the tops let me see things that are far away. I mean, right now, Johnny Scarborough back there, I know he's back there because I saw him earlier, but without my glasses on, he's a I can still tell it's Johnny, but he's blood. But now he's clear. If I tried to read without my glasses on, I mean, those words would look like a blur, but with my glasses and the bottoms of them, they're clear. We need that kind of vision here. Because the world that we live in is a lot like that view of my parents' house. I mean, my parents did have a really nicely manicured guard yard up in the front of the house, but if you moved out just a little bit further from that immediate front yard into the larger yard, there were rocks and cactus and just 
Well, I, and that's, that's the thing, though, is that, that you, you look out and you see just that glass. But then you look out further and you see the beauty. You see, because as people of faith, we look out and we see the mess of the world. And by the way, I'm not talking at all about the political situation when I'm talking about the mess of the world. We see hungry kids. We see all kinds of need around us. We see those heart-wrenching situations. But then we look up and we look out further and what we really see out further is we see the coming kingdom of God that's going to be a part of our life one day. <coughs> and in between, we're supposed to take care of those needs and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's our call. And I want to submit to you today that I have a vision for this congregation. Now, part of this vision has come about by listening to you. And the thing I hear from you most often, the thing I hear more than anything else, we need young families. I'm going to tell you right now, you are not going to get very many young families in this church unless if we're doing ministry for young families. We have to have programming here for children and for teenagers and programming for their parents as well. And we've got to reach out into the world because people don't come to church anymore. We've got to take the church to them. We are called on to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world around us. And so we've got to leave the building and go do the work. Going and doing the work. Tutoring in our schools. I know that there are many of you who are either currently educators or former educators. You know better than I do, teachers cannot do it alone. <clears throat> Some teacher or former teacher should have said amen to that. I'm going to say it again because nobody said it. I want to make sure you heard it. Teachers cannot do it alone. Amen. Thank you. Pull it teeth sometimes. <laughs> <sighs> they need our help. And I want to submit to you, I know from personal experience, that the work that a volunteer does in schools and helping our kids learn to read and helping our kids learn that 3 plus 4 equals 7 and yes, that does mean I can do a little bit of math. The things that not only affect their grade, it can affect them personally. We make a difference not only in their academics, but we make a difference in their attitudes and their behaviors. We make a difference because of the thing God is calling us to do. What would it look like if there were members of this church every day on one of our school campuses helping out in however the teachers need to help? What would it look like? What would it look like if we had more people up at West Rapids Cares because to do that we're helping feed hungry kids. Not just hungry adults, but hungry, hungry kids who have nothing at all to do with the situation they find themselves in in life. What might it look like if we truly got behind the dance program that we're we're currently housing here that Vanessa Hires has been working on. What would it look like to have that program that she's 
she's trying to do at no cost to the kids because so many kids can't afford to do it. But what would it look like to have that photo? And, and, and then once a quarter or so, have them come in as a part of our worship service in, in a, a Christian liturgical dance to give them both a place to perform and a place to feel love. What would that look like? What difference might that make for our congregation? And then, what if we, one Saturday in December, we got one of us to put on a Santa Claus suit? I mean, I'll do it if nobody else will. And to sit in the Family Life Center at an event we call Breakfast for Santa, and we, we invite kids and their families to come at no cost. We're going to feed them pancakes. Pancakes are cheap. We can afford that. We invite them to come to eat breakfast and sit on Santa's lap. Tell them what they want for Christmas. I have a friend who, who uh, dresses up as Santa in the schools where he serves every year. And he goes and he listens to the kids, like some of his church members who, who take notes for morning. And last year, in the school district where he was, he went into the elementary school and this little boy got on Santa's lap and he said all he wanted for Christmas was blankets for his family. If that doesn't break your heart, we need to have another talk about what Jesus expects of us and how Jesus sees the world. His church took care of making sure everybody had blankets and then some. But we can use that as an opportunity to find some real need in our community. I mean, not, they don't have the latest, greatest toy to play with, but real need. Not enough clothes. No blankets to keep them. We can make a difference. But it's going to take us doing it. We're not going to make a difference unless if we work together to make that difference. Week before last or so, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I looked it up on the internet again. This was a picture that I posted along with a, a clip and I researched it and found out it is absolutely accurate. This, go back one if we can. This teacher in South Carolina in elementary school realized that the boys in his class didn't know manners, didn't know his how to conduct themselves in different situations and didn't know what it was like to dress professionally. So he started something he called the Gentleman's Club. And he started <coughs> buying the kids, if they couldn't afford it, buying them shirts and ties and jackets. And they dress up for school one day a week. And you know, my son told me at one point when he was playing football, he had to wear a tie to school. I don't know why a coach makes us wear a tie on game day. No discipline problems. The behavior is different. This teacher knew that. But he also taught, been teaching these boys the importance of saying, yes ma'am and no ma'am and yes sir and no sir. They've taken the time to set up a, a dinner for the kids and they put out all the formal flatware and placeware and all that stuff and, and teach them what fork you're supposed to use for eating your salad. But those things matter. And we live in a world that has rapidly forgotten a whole lot of those things. And I, while he was doing it with the boys, girls are just as important. And I would submit to you that this is a ministry that we can be part of. I met this past Thursday with our school superintendent, and I told him about this, and he's really excited about it. But if he's going to make it happen, it's going to take help from people like us. Not just the Methodist Church, but we need to be a part of it. That's the close vision. Now for the further vision, to look further out, because that's what our real objective is. Our real objective, I mean, yeah, we feed them, <coughs> but our real objective is to teach them about Jesus Christ 
and to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's our mission. That's the thing we are called to do. If we are doing anything less than working to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, we have missed the boat entirely. We are called, as people of faith, to be that person. But make no mistake, there is a cost to that. What's the cost? Well, I mean, there's going to be some financial costs. I mean, if we do the Breakfast with Santa thing, I'd love to give all the kids a New Testament as a gift when they get off of Santa's lap. You know, nobody can go to the mall and they take pictures of Santa. Sometimes they'll give them a toy or something, some little cheap thing. I don't want to give them a toy. I want to give them a Bible. And yeah, there's some cost to that. I looked it up on Coast Ferry last night. It's about 50 cents. Fifty cents to make a difference in the life of the kids. If they can't read a Bible, they don't have. We as people of faith need to be about that way. I have long said, actually what I've said, I'm going to back off of a little bit. I mean, if a church can't afford to give Bibles to people, it's time to close, is what I've long said. But what I'll say really probably a better thing to say if the church can't afford to give Bibles to people, we need to reevaluate both our budget and our priorities. Because that's part of what we're called to do. So yeah, there's some financial costs there. I'm not going to deny that. But there is also other costs as well. I mean, there's a cost of time. And it doesn't cost us a penny to go sit and listen to a kid read at the school. But it does cost us a little bit in time. But the real cost isn't in money or in time. The real cost is us. But you see, Jesus said to pick up your cross and follow me if you're going to be my disciples. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. That's a big cost. But it's a big call. And it's a call that I know we are intended to do. Whether we do it is up to us, but I know it's a call that we are intended to do. Now, when we go out to my parents' old place outside of Bernie and we look around and we see all of those, those rocks out there that are up close, and all that cactus, I put that picture in there because it was a better example than anything else I had, except really not from their house. It's really not even from Texas, from Arizona. But, but you see all that cactus and all that, and you think, what? Barren wasteland. There can't be anything here. But is it completely a barren wasteland? There's life there. There's cactus there. One of the things about the hill country is even though I think sometimes it looks like the desert, in the springtime for a relatively short period of time, there are blue bonnets all over the place out there. And for my money, that's beauty. There may be cactus and rocks among the blue bonnets, but there's life there. But not only is there plant life there, there's wildlife there. Kelly, for both of our sakes, I love the snakes that are there out. <laughs> but thank you. But, but there's, there's wildlife there. There is life among that barren land. And you know what? When we look at the wasteland that is our society, there's life in the barren land. Now, it sometimes may be hard on those animals, especially in those times when it seems like it doesn't ever rain. They find a way to make it. And sometimes they may find sustenance in the most unexpected places. And I would argue that the same is true for us. There's life there, and we need to be the unexpected place where people find sustenance for their souls. That's making disciples. That's our call. 
And if we work at doing that, when we move from that close vision out past the baby disciples and into the, the far vision to the beauty that is beyond us, the beauty that we can see out there in our distance, I know that you're going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.